Hello everyone, this is David Darryl Madwhite reviewing Bronze Age Manzets from Bronze Age Perverts. And some of you might be surprised due to various reasons. You might say, who is this guy? Why are you reviewing this guy? Blah, 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 blah. So Bronze Age Pervert is Twitter famous. I, he has around 40,000 followers on Twitter, something like that. Um... I don't follow him. Uh, I'm not a I'm not a fanboy. That doesn't mean I hate the guy. Uh, it's just that he's a guy that I think is interesting, which is why I read his book. And best way to summarize his political views, because he is a politically minded guy, is he's a right wing gym nationalist or bodybuilder nationalist, whatever you want to call it. He has a strong emphasis on this kind of a nomadic life uh, uh, mindset. Bron as, as that's the base of his book, Bro Bronze Age Mindset. He has an emphasis on this nomadic mindset, uh, masculinity, right? Healthy emphasis on masculinity that men need to have. And that's kind of his book. And as he says in the intro, it's an exhortation. It's not a academic philosophical book. It's an exhortation, right? So he writes it in his own style. It's an independently published book. So it's not an academic book. It doesn't have... It doesn't have crazy footnotes. It doesn't have anything like that. And because it is not an academic book, I will not treat it as an academic book. Nevertheless, if I feel like there's something he said that is right, I will praise him for it. If there's something that he says that is wrong, I will criticize him for it. And I will provide why I think it's wrong, where I disagree, where I agree, as it should be, because this is a review of the book. I'm not a fanboy. I'm not going to... Uh, hail everything he says as gospel neither am i a hater who's going to m criticize every single small thing i see there's a lot of things that i could have criticized and it's not even about the content of the book more so about like the style of writing but again it's independently published it's not an academic paper who cares okay who cares did i have fun reading it i did uh i did have fun reading it but did, do i read these things because i want to have fun no I read these things to learn, and I don't think anyone will read this book to have fun. Uh, <laughs> but is it is it written in a way you can read? Yeah. Uh, it is a decent. Am I going to recommend this book? Am I going to say, oh, you should read this book. You should not read this book. Uh, I'm not going to do either. I'm not going to recommend this to you. I'm not going to not recommend this to you. I'm not going to say don't read this. Nor am I going to say read this. If you want to read it, read it. If you don't want to read it, then, you know, let it aside. Uh, this is really for people that are just interested in what he has to say. In what, again, what he has to say. So, why did I read him exactly? Why did I, why did I, why was I interested in what he had to say? Well, I kind of remember the first time I went to Twitter, this was back when, before I even had a YouTube channel, and I will see people posting about this guy all the time, I will say Twitter, say, follow this guy, follow this dude, and I'll see a lot of people talking about him at the time, now they don't do that anymore, but first time I joined, it was impossible for you to not know him, because he will be on your timeline all the time, and so I will, I was, you know, I was interested, you know, what is this guy about? I mean, I guess he's right wing, but how exactly is he right wing? Is he like nationalistic? Is he, I don't know, is he capitalistic? Like, what is he exactly? And so I read what people thought of him. I read some of his tweets and I kind of had some idea. I'm not going to pretend as if I have a full idea. I read some of his alternate. It's weird because he has like, like mini bops that I like to call them. He has like these mini bops. Like you have the ortho bop guys and you have... Like the like the atheist pop bop guys, you're the Catholic bop guys, and like like all of these like different versions of him corresponding to different religious traditions. And I thought that was very interesting. I like the something about like there being one source and like decentralized different manifestations of the ones. It's something about that speaks a lot to me personally. That's why I like the idea of feudalism a lot. It's 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 not logical it's just that like it resonates with me like the idea of there being one ruler but with every for example uh city region you have like different layers of rulers that whole thing just tickles my autism okay if it doesn't to you then that's completely fine it's just something about me that i really like um 
So when I noticed all of these things, and that, that doesn't mean I approved with everything. As a matter of fact, a lot of the things that they said, I was like, this is crazy. <laughs> um, because it will contradict my religious beliefs. And obviously, I'm going to say my religious beliefs come first. I think everyone should put their religious beliefs first above everything else. I think this is 100% what every, everyone should be doing. Uh, so some of the things that contradicted what I believed. And so I was like, I kind of felt weird. Kind of feel, felt strange when I saw this. But nevertheless, this kind of is the reason why I decided to say, you know, let's read this guy. Uh, let's see what he has to say because, you know, with people, with, with personalities, online personalities, when it comes to politics, there tends to be this disconnect between the person that people are following and the followers themselves. The the person that the people... Yeah, I think I formulated that sentence correctly. Whatever, you probably understood it. For example, Trump. Um, a lot of people put their own images on what kind of a person Trump is. But does that correspond to what Trump is in reality? No. And I think this happens with a lot of people. This happens with... Jean-Francois Grepi, who got banned on YouTube, I think. Uh, maybe he's back. He's on YouTube. I don't know. Uh, this happens with Trump. I think this happens with Putin a lot. And I think it definitely happens with every single political person, whether they're, they're a politician, president, king, or even just a mouthpiece, right? So that's kind of what, what made me say I wanted to see what he was like. And, and another reason why... Is that when I was preparing for the debate with the origin, it was going to be with Severn Zealot. But when I was preparing for a debate, um, I read like 12, 13 different books in two months. And I'm not saying this to Brad, but I had this period where after the debate was done, I just said, oh, I, I, I'm not, I don't want to read anymore. I'm so bored. So I had a two week period where I just didn't read any books. Instead, I played video and visual novels like any true anime patrician like myself will do and it's the part where everyone's going to click x in this video but um after two weeks i said okay let's read something again uh let's let's start reading something again so i had a m multiple options and i kind of felt like i had to change some things up and decide to read what should i start with by changing something things up and i think bronze age mindset was a great example um in terms of what I believe already, before reading the book, what I already believed about this kind of like gym nationalism stuff is that I had positive views. Am I going to say that I'm part of that idea? No. Why? Because I don't apply it to reality. If you've seen how I look like, I don't look like someone who goes to the gym. Um, and I kind of feel like if I was pretending that I was like this bodybuilder nationalist clique, but I didn't even try for anything it will be like calling yourself a christian but saying oh by the way i don't believe in god uh okay you're not a christian then right that's kind of what I, that doesn't mean that oh you can only be a bodybuilder nationalist if you're like super muscular i don't believe that either way um i'm just saying that you kind of have to have that in reality in some sense you have to be going to gym you have to work out you can be a scrawny fucktar but if you're working out then i think you can call yourself that because you are at least working out but I'm not, so I'm not going to talk as if uh, I'm doing that. So let's begin with this book. And there's a lot of things to talk about. So uh, I'm not good with preparing how to go with the book. I'll, I just have my notes and I'll just go through them one by one by one. Some of the notes I might connect if I remember. If I don't remember, I'm, I'm not going to be able to connect them. This is all in one take. There is no editing done. It's all in one take, so I might have periods where I just start thinking and just pause for 10 seconds. If that happens, bear with me. So, Bob starts this book by talking about Darwinism, evolution. He criticizes the idea of uh, Darwinism, although he does believe in Darwinism in, in some sense. But he does critique it for various different reasons. I have some screenshots that I will be showing you on the screen. So one of the things he talks about, and I think this is a very good critique, is that uh, animals who have some sense of nobility, and this includes human beings, refuse to breed in captivity, right? Many animals, not just man, uh, 
As a matter of fact, I will just read from what he says. He says, The most noble animals refuse to breed in captivity. Many animals, not just man, choose death when trapped. But does that not... But I thought all life, the purpose of life was survival and reproduction. Isn't that what Darwinists say? Exactly. What is the purpose of life? Reproducing? Surviving? But we see animals and men in captivity, they don't survive. They don't choose survival. In fact, they choose death. So this doesn't match up with reality. And I think this is a very good critique that Bob has. When thinkers talk about evolutionary psychology, they abstract from the way of yeast, right? They abstract from the way of bacteria and apply it to the animals and apply it to men. But this is backward, says Bronze Age pervert. And I don't have anything to critique here. I think this is an excellent point. Um, if I was to add something, it will... If I do have something to add... Uh, what did I say? Notes. Well, if I was to add something, it's related to teleology. I think this just proves that the Darwinist, atheistic worldview is just ultimately inconsistent. doesn't match up to reality. He says that the idea of heredity and even evolution does not come with Darwin. This is very true. Not many people realize this, but evolution is not a merely scientific belief. I don't think that is what Bob is saying, but I will say evolution is not even a scientific belief. It is a philosophical belief. It's not a merely scientific something that we can observe. No, there's a philosophical package behind it. And there were, philosophic, there were religious beliefs that did believe in evolution. Bob talks about how dialectics are being used to confuse these people. They um, He talks about the dialectic between the idea of hating heredity and loving nature. In fact, I will read this section here. Um, he claims this is not, this is a part I disagree. He claims that the left, he calls them the bug men, the bug man, which I will also use that term as well because I like it. I think that all leftists are bug men. They're all, I think leftism itself is evil. Um, the bug men hate the idea of heredity. I do agree with the, them hating the idea of heredity. This is very true. And them hating the idea of nature. Uh, but in some sense, I don't agree because if you look at if you look at the elite and how they weaponize Darwinism, I think this becomes very clear that there is in some sense some Darwinistic elements that are weaponized. But I think at the same time, for Bob's, Bob's credit, his insight will be the more correct one in the sense that uh, they're not using, they're not pushing the hereditary aspect today, but rather the philosophical aspect behind it. So he says... In this section, I will read it for you. The problem now is you think I want to attack. He has his own style of writing. This is what's beautiful about being self-published is that you, can, you have freedom to do what you want. Attack the idea of evolution or to change it because it's racist or uncomfortable. Just like the left and others attack or suppress it. First of all, I don't think the left attacks and suppresses Darwinism. Um, I don't know where he gets that from. This is not true. Listen, you don't need Darwin to believe in heredity and even evolution. People knew about heredity and different lineages of man long before Darwin. Exactly. Uh, in the political sense, the promotion of Darwin teaching and its application to mankind is a greater good. Uh, this is the part where I huge disagreement. We see the political promotion of Darwinism. It does anything but that, actually. So this, this is what confuses me, is that he separates the idea of heredity and even evolution, which I don't even agree with evolution, but he separates the idea of heredity from Darwinism, but then he says political Darwinism is good. But I thought you could separate these, two, these things. Why don't we just push heredity? <laughs> uh, the left and its many robots want nothing more than to hide truth about human nature. Yeah, I agree. And Darwin, evolutionary science in all its forms, is a great weapon of truth against them. Again, um... I think Darwinism, all it does is promote this kind of nihilistic view that many bugmen have today, this kind of deterministic 
Bugman philosophy. In all this, I agree. But remember the marionettes I mentioned. Right, so he's the marionettes he was talking about is referring to dialectics, how different seemingly opposing views are being used against each other, and the idea of nuance is just taken away. Uh, don't be distracted by the puppet play. It is important not to be misled by a fierce debate with a stupid opponent into just accepting the only other alternative that is presented to you. Although the left, or what I have termed the bug man, hates and fears evolutionary ideas applied to humans. Darwinism itself is the product of bug thought. In the end, it won't show you a way out of the prison of the ages, right? So he is pointing out that, yes, actually Darwinism will not tell you about the meaning of life. It's not going to tell you about telos. It's not going to be telling you about any of these things. The hereditary nature of the qualities and the solutability of an organism into its environment and vice versa, all of this is true of observation. Um... But all of the things that he has talked about here is not Darwinism. That's just adaptation, heredity. That's not Darwinism. <laughs> uh, I don't like. I don't think macroevolution is the case. I, I will be. I haven't seen. Maybe I skimmed through. Um, that's another thing, by the way. This review is not going to be like a perfect hundred percent review. There might be things that I missed. There might. There is going to be things that I skip. But I didn't see his take on macroevolution. I'll be very interested to see that. All of this is a true observation, and that true observation about heredity is in the end enough. You don't need more than that to utterly crush all the designs and vanities of the Bugman. The Bugman hears heredity and nature, not Darwin. Then, later on, he makes another great point against Darwinism. Darwinism contradicts itself when it argues for its system, he says. Because its system requires teleology. This is something that I didn't speak out against, but speak out against. But I hundred percent agree. This is this is a great point. I mean, does it evolution require telos? If you're if, if, the 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 idea of evolving presupposes telos. Why are you evolving? What's the point of evolving? Exactly. And Darwinists, modern bug men. Reject teleology. Exactly. Uh, Bob says that there's an intelligence in all things. So he's he's talking about an idea of intelligence, but he says that we don't know, he doesn't know what it is. So he kind of has this deistic view is what, I, again, does he really have that? I don't know. Uh, he didn't explicitly talk about it in the book. Maybe if he did, then I'm stupid and I'm retarded and I didn't understand it. <laughs> so there's that risk again. Um, but... To me, it seems like deism. He has this kind of like deistic view about the intelligence in all things. He says this in, in the world of Malthus and of Darwin, life under filth, life under distress. Darwinism describes life under extreme stress. And so for him, Darwinism is the philosophy of life in a sense, but it's the philosophy of life of the tenement and the slum of the open air work camp is what he says. Interesting point. Uh, I don't have any more any more comments. I just want to point that out. Uh, I I wrote that the Darwinist lifestyle of slavery and emasculation forces people with some sense of nobility to commit suicide, then to live under co conditions not fit for them. Right? Again, highlighting the point: if the meaning of life was reproduction and survival, why does this even happen? Right? Is it survival the number one thing that we all have in our mind? Well, the idea of suicide actually contradicts that. And it's not just human beings that commit suicide. So this is this is this is one of the first critiques that I have of Bob. He says, I'm quoting him, as rare as beautiful bodies are, the mind in the same condition is even more rare. Let us strive in our decrepit, cancerous, and fetid world for what is concrete and what we can try to attain. Those who forget the body to pursue a perfect mind or perfect soul have no idea where to even start. Sounds convincing. Only physical beauty is the foundation for a true higher culture of the mind and spirit as well. This is a key word. This is a key passage. Only physical beauty is the foundation. Foundation is a key word here. For a true higher culture of the mind and spirit. Only sun and steel will show you the path. I disagree with this. Why do I disagree with this? Do I disagree with the promotion of physical beauty? No. What I disagree with is the idea that only physical beauty is the foundation for a true higher culture of the mind and spirit. Because let's argue for the sake of it. 
if physical beauty is the if the foundation for a higher culture in this particular case starts with what is physical then the ultimate foundation should that not also start with physical well yes it is if it starts with something immaterial then it also will start with something immaterial then you know you will have to do it reverse then bob will have to say it starts with the mind with the soul and then it comes down to physical beauty but bob doesn't say that he says the opposite but there's a one-to-one -one correspondence there if then if ultimately all source of beauty is physical uh, knowing that what is physical what is matter matter changes matter is in flux if what is physical endures change then does that not mean that beauty also changes? In fact, it does. That is the point. If beauty changes, then one day being muscular might be the ideal form of beauty, but then being a scrawny, pencil-necked bug man might be the ideal form of beauty the next day. Right? Obviously, Bob will say, that doesn't make any sense. I disagree. That, that does not make any logical sense. That's the point. It doesn't make any sense. I do agree. But that's what the logic leads to, I think. Now, later on, he will talk about how matter is eternal. So the only way, to, way out, I think, is monism. But you can't even know if monism is true. Because if all things are one, then there's no distinctions. Distinctions are illusory. Then there's no change at all. Change is illusory. But then how can you come to a state of mind from not knowing monism is true to knowing monism is true? You can't. So epistemologically speaking, it's impossible to even know whether monism is true if you're a monist. So you can't, be even, you can't even be making that argument. Uh, that will be my counter response. This, oh, I, I love this section. This section is like the high point of the book for me. I love this part. Especially the way it starts. Um... Yeah. Hold up. Chimp in state of nature never jerks off, but in captivity he does. What does this mean? <laughs> I love this quote. This is like the best quote in the book I've ever seen. Because it's it's I don't know. It's it's really good. It's it sounds innocent, but it makes a very powerful point. In state of nature, the chimp is too busy. He is concerned with mastering space. He's concerned with doing things, right? Solving problem of life in and under trees, mastering the tools, mastering social relations in a jockeying for power and stat status. Does this sound similar to you? This applies to human beings as well. That's kind of the point here. Deprived of this drive to development else and self-increase, he devolves to pointless masturbation and captivity where he senses he is in own space and therefore the futility of all his efforts and all his actions. So I guess one of his points here is that in the all creatures had has this nomadic spirit where they want to conquer space, right? Own some sort of space. But in captivity, your space is limited. And in captivity, because your space is limited, once you conquered all of the space in captivity, you don't really have any more purpose in that sense. And this is why if you apply this to the to human reality, right? The idea of um, small, <laughs> sm how should I say this? Housing where you have a very small area of life. This, is, this happens in Far Eastern Japan. Bob has a lot to say about Far Eastern Japan, Far East, East Asia. And Bob has a lot to say about Far East Asia. Uh, this applies 100%. So I think there's a point that he makes. The onanism of modern society is connected with its supposed hypersexualization and its infertility. It's not really hypersexualization, but the devolution of the spirit to the lassitude, lassitude of a diffuse and weak sexuality. Life in own space becomes drained of energy through low grade pointless titillation, and nofap is a kind of a cargo cult that tries to reestablish energy in order on path of ascent. So I think his point, he does say it's a successful cargo cult. But whether, you, whether it, NoFap even works, you can see it within a week, right? If, if it doesn't last a week, then it doesn't work. So Bob, his criticism of NoFap, NoFap is that there's a good purpose, but it doesn't tackle a real problem, right? Uh, if you live in captivity and you're not masturbating, well, what's the point? 
What are you doing? Right? What are you doing? First, what comes is the idea of freedom and having freedom, not being in captivity. And then NoFap comes afterwards. Then you can do NoFap. But you must have, you must be able to master space. You must be able to do something with your time, right? You must be able to, I don't know, work at a job, do something that you want to do, do anything. But because modern life is full of comfort, and we're in comfort, we're in a self-imposed captivity. Because we're in a self-imposed captivity, what do people resort to? Masturbation. So masturbation, ultimately, is something that comes because, oh, no pun intended, uh, it, it, it becomes because you really don't, because you live a life of comfort, you're not trying to do other things. You're happy, you're content with the way you are. So you sit in a self-imposed captivity. You're a chimp, you're a fag, you jack off. You jack off day and night because you just have nothing else to do. So I better just increase my dopamine. This is exactly why masturbation happens. So I'll, I love this point. Uh, the first thing about all this is that women, censor is the woman, Women have exceptionally good antennae for this kind of thing. And when a man frees himself from these pressures, they see this from very far away. So for Bob, women suck your life energy out. So if you even succeed in mastering space, right, kind of like ascending to stop, stop being a kuma, right? You stop being a kuma, you ascend into being something else. He says women can see that and now they have a reason to suck your life force from you. Interesting. They have an instinct to seek out ascending life and drain it. They and the species thereby achieve their goals, but you're bled dry and sometimes left a husk. They revert life back to its irritated state, and, the, and by their drainage of vital essence, they've laid low of many great tasks. Another page that I want to show to you in this book. Uh, he was speaking about hormones. He calls them hormones, <laughs> which is funny. Uh, when, when, when I speak of hormones, you might think I'm a materialist or I'm saying you're like a machine. This is of many science guys. Uh, actually, many on the left claim to have this attitude, though they can never explain what moral force their rights and compassion have. Thank you. Exactly. That's the point. If it doesn't come from God or have some reality in human nature, which I don't think they have, without God, I don't think you even have a reality in human nature. So it does come from God. When they say they're atheists, I never believe them. Atheists act like Stalin or Brezhnev, not like Presbyterian school marm. The truth is that these who make the core of the modern left are moral fanatics. They're moral fags, even though they don't have any morals. There's not a drop of atheism or relativism in them. They don't enjoy the clear air of skepticism and never have. I don't, although I don't understand the, well, I don't see how skepticism is a clear air. I think many skeptics are bigger faggots, in fact, but it's another part. They always sneak in the soul or free will when you're not looking. They actually get off on this and are acting out of spite, even spite against themselves. That's a great point. They want to feel they're not in control. My hormones maybe do it right. What is this you apart from your hormones, your genes, your inborn instinct then? Exactly. In atheism, personhood is reduced to hormones, right? It's reduced to the, just your body or what your body does. It's the genes, it's the environment, it's the economy or the oppression, all versions of the milieu theory and neurotics theory, according to Nietzsche. This is how they can also get themselves to believe in the transgenders. These are people who believe that matter can somehow be corruptly configured and that we all have disembodied souls with male or female essences. The whole attempt to redefine identity, not just sexual identity, is a matter of decision, meaning decision made arbitrarily. Does he say anything here, or am I just reading nothing? Blah, 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 blah. The first lines of the Iliad makes this clear. You'd have, you do have a soul of sorts apart from your body. It just isn't you. It's a shade. It's completely homosexual. Uh, I guess he's denying the idea of a soul. There's a lot wrong there. Obviously, that contradicts with Christianity, but... Let's move on. I don't have much to say there. 
He says that animals walk around in a state of permanent religious intoxication. So he's talking about the importance of some kind of a religious worldview, religious understanding of reality. He said this is a natural condition of the mind and intellect. So the natural state of all creation is to be in a religious mindset. I agree. Although Bob will probably say, comes to a different conclusion, whereas I would say yes. And ultimately, uh, it's a state of logos, it's a state of believing in a Christian God. Interesting uh, insight that he makes that I think is worthy to mention. Discoveries, he says, the, they don't come from reason, but from direct perception from man of that discovery. And he says that reason explicates the discovery in an imperfect way. Uh, so he gives an example does he mention here in this page? No, I don't I, I put this in note, but essentially there some people, there's an example he gives in the book where someone f makes a discovery. And then the next thing he says, I made a discovery. Now I have to explain it in a rational way where it makes sense. And he says that the direct perception of it comes first. And then you had a rational explanation. That's a great point. Uh, I think it kind of contradicts his, the way he view things because he does have if you look at his book he does have this kind of um like subjective observation based view so i kind of think that kind of comes into a contradiction in some sense but uh i think it matches up in, in orthodox christianity we have we can observe the essence of realities with our news as well uh many orthodox church fathers right they don't they don't come to the Trinity through logic, right? They come to the Trinity, they come through these doctrines, through spiritual right life, to, to the news. And so their perception of that comes first, and the rational explanations that we see in the books comes after. So even so, what we get, even then, what we get there is an imperfect version of what they get. And I don't think a lot of people realize that, but this is actually indeed the case. So. This does map up towards that spirituality. Uh, is this worthy to put here? Let me. I put this on as a note, but oh, he's in this. Yeah, he's talking about basically saying what I said. Um, he talks about modern peasant and the uh, previous peasant. He says that the modern peasant is not that diff different, right? The modern person who's atheistic, secularist. He points out that they're not really atheistic. But they're, they're just as superstitious as the villagers. Instead, their superstitions are science. So the bug men love science, but they're superstitious about science. They only like science, what it confers. This is my commentary, that is. He loves them because of the creature comforts. He believes they provide true technology. He's a cargo cultist. This is what Bob says. He knows nothing of what goes into the discoveries of science, nor the way the substance is transmitted among scientists. He just has a propagandized image of some of the results. I have no comments. This is an excellent comment. And a lot of his... Uh, critique on like the science people, like the science obsessed redditor atheist people, is really good. It's really solid. Uh, he Bob speaks about having some form of childlike animism in his adolescence. He will talk. He talked about how he will venerate inanimate objects, and he will have this without learning it from any any anyone else. And, and so he kind of added. He comes to he comes to that right. He does that. He venerates, he feels importance, some kind of spiritual importance to objects. And he says, well, I had this experience, therefore, I guess this must be the case. I don't know. Uh, this is very faulty in, in, many, in many different ways. Um, again, you, there are contradicting experiences, right? So unless you're going to appeal to relativism, uh, what 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 response do you have then? I mean, that's just one of the things, one of the problems that he will have. And another thing I want to add is that I think in the Christian conception, right? For example, Bob will maybe ask, well, it's not just me; it's many other people that had this kind of idea of importance of objects. How would your religion explain that? Well, we can explain it that there is an idea of veneration, 
<coughs> St. John of Damascus talks about it in in uh, his three treatises on the divine images. And he explicitly makes various different points that you can check out, you can read it, read him for yourself. But he points he points out that veneration, right, veneration uh has a point in Christianity. You do venerate relics, you venerate images, but that doesn't mean you worship images, right? The worship is only to God, but there is a veneration of objects, a veneration of people, a veneration of icons, images. And so what I will say is that the way I can explain it to you, the animism, it, the part of venerating objects, that's actually not wrong. In, a, in and of itself, but it's misplaced, okay, it's misplaced, so you have some form of the logos, some form of the truth, you're just misplacing the truth, because you don't have the revelation, because without revelation, we cannot come through this true natural theology, right, this is the kind of the big thing that the West has, natural theology, and a lot of Bob's critique of Christianity, of Monteism, is natural theology, uh, but what if that Christian rejects natural theology? Well, then he doesn't have anything. But he did I don't know if he has it. Maybe he does, but he doesn't write it in the book. <clears throat> he. Uh, so he has criticisms of the Christian monotheistic position. <clears throat> Let me just get a drink because I've got a parched throat. I need to be able to speak. And. So far, the review is not good. I'm, I'm not doing a good job at explaining things. I'm pausing a bit too much. Um, I'm doing the um things. Um, am, um, a lot of the times. But as I said, it's one take. I don't want to spend too much energy <laughs> on this. Um, but I also want to make sure that I... <clears throat> Express his views properly, because I would hate that. I I hate I hate like misrepresenting people. <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, that was a fun break. Let's move on. So he says that matter cannot be created. It's not original, right? If if matter is created and not eternal, well, that's not original. It's not original. It's unobservable. You can't observe it even in reality. And he said, this is not even an original belief. Many of the pagan ideas, many of the Hindu Buddhist ideas believe in eternal matter. And that it's un that's that that the world is uncreated. He says, monotheism, this is me quoting him, monotheism, even of the intellectual deist variety, and especially that variety, makes all kinds of claims, too, about the lawless, lawfulness of matter or of nature, about intelligent, intelligent design and the like. It's actually much closer to the science that claims to disprove it. What? Is Bob conflating logic with science? <clears throat> because I think that's what he's doing. How is it closer to the science that claims to disprove it? Does science even disprove it, right? The idea of laws of nature, laws of matter, laws of morality, that's not scientific. That's not a science-based thing. That's a philosophical question. So, I don't... I don't it, it really confused... It, it genuinely confused me when I read this. Like, what is he saying? So much of this story makes time a line and makes matter conditional on a deity or creator that lives outside it. The creation of matter out of nothing, the creation of, of your soul out of nothing, matter is dead in some way homogenous, and its meaning is divine, <clears throat> only in the sense that it reveals the creation of the external deity, or even better, just the laws he made to God. No, that's not true. That is not true. Matter is, first of all, matter is good because it's created. Everything God creates is good. That's number one. Number two, matter is not divine because it reveals, only because it reveals God. There's an aspect to it, but that's not the only reason. In fact, when Christ became human, he was made out of matter. God became matter to deify matter. So now, even creation, even, even matter is now divine. The space we inhibit is divine now because of Christ's incarnation. So, and it's not divine in the sense that, oh, you're a pantheism. No, it's not pantheism. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're not saying the matter is God's essence, or and that's stupid. 
but it is divine in some sense. So that's not the only reason. I'm sorry, but uh, this refutes Western Christianity. Yes, it does. Uh, it, these are strong critiques of Roman Catholicism, Protestantism. Uh, does it even touch orthodoxy? Not at all. Uh, he says, creation ex nihilo requires the idea of fate, which is foreign to pagans. There's two things I want to say here. Number one, if he's talking about fideism, then that's true. But fideism, but having fate is not fideism. Right? These are two different things. Uh, number two, if you look at Gödel's incompleteness theorem, fate is actually basis for all logical models. This is already this has already been done with Gödel. Check out his incompleteness theorem. There's a lot of videos of people doing that. I'll put them in the description. So fate is actually an integral part of logical systems. So uh, I don't think it was foreign to the pagans. I don't think I don't I don't believe that. I don't think that makes any sense. So I want to talk about the idea of eternal matter, eternal creation. So first of all, uh, there were people that critiqued. Uh, pre in the pre-Socratic era, to my knowledge, the idea of matter being eternal. There were people, uh, maybe it was Zeno, but I might be wrong, but there were, I think, Zeno argued that if creation was eternal, that will mean that change will be illusory. So even back then, you had those kind of critiques. And again, that leads to monism because not even monism, but if change is illusory, if change is an illusion, then you changing your mind to believing in that is an illusion. Epistemically speaking, again, with the same problem with monism, you can't even come to that conclusion. He speaks uh, about infinite cycles. That's determinism. That is determinism. That does lead to it. Now, I don't think Bob will argue for determinism, but that is deterministic. And, it, and if determinism is true, like this form of determinism of infinite cycles, then I'm sorry, but what's the point of having a Bronze Age mindset then? And more importantly, Bob says he believes in evolution. And he, by the way, in the next section, he talks about reincarnation. He believes in reincarnation. Uh, but there's a problem there. What is that problem? Evolution means people improve, like things improve as time goes on, right? If everyone improves over time, which by the way, time doesn't even exist because it's eternal. Uh, but let's say for the sake of argument, right, there's improvement. Then, but, but, but Bob says we have devolved. And a huge portion of his book is dedicated to proving how the ancient Greeks are much more superior to, the, to modern people. But if that's the case, how was there an evolution? It seems like instead we devolved. Doesn't seem like there's an evolution. Seems like there's a devolution. Now, I think you can have devolution in that system, but uh, I, I still think it's a bit weird. I mean, especially with the idea of reincarnation. I mean, what kind of a reincarnation are we speaking? If, if, if the ancient Greek was reincarnated, if he believes that an ancient Greek is reincarnated to the modern age, which he doesn't define, he kind of critiques the other forms of reincarnation, so I don't know what kind of a reincarnation he's arguing for. But if he is attacking, if he's attacking the idea of, no, more so, if he's defending the idea of reincarnation, is a Greek from the old ages reincarnated into, like he talks about animals, right? For example, he talks about if an ant dies, right? there's a unified mind of all ants, and when an ant dies, there's another ant coming to replace him, right? But does it... So he talks about the lower creatures having that kind of reincarnation, but how does it apply to human beings? I didn't really get that part. Maybe he does talk about it, and I'm just really stupid and retarded. And if I am really stupid and retarded, I will not even mind if he tweeted and said, this guy is stupid, I mentioned it here. Uh, it has to be in the book, by the way, because I didn't check his website. I probably should have, but I'm going off on the book here. But if a Greek was reincarnated in the modern age and he's devolved, doesn't that contradict with what he's saying? It does. So there's not evolution, there's devolution. Uh, and what's very interesting is that Bob says that the hatred of matter is Jewish. Oh, by the way, I want to say, uh, how can there not be change in an eternal... Like, if, if creation is eternal, if time is eternal, how can there be 
no change because change presupposes beginning, middle, and end. There's a beginning of change and a process of change and the end of change where that thing that changed is changed into something else. You can't have that in an eternal timeline. It's impossible. So it has to be an illusion. Anyways, Bob says that the hatred of matter is Jewish. What? And he says it predates the Bible. What? Excuse me? <laughs> That's the strangest thing I read because the whole point of biblical Hebrew theology is that matter creation is good. And later on, Bob admits that. So I'm, I'm incredibly confused as what his point is. Uh, I mean, it might be true of Kabbalists and all that. Modern Jews, for example, it might be true of them. But uh, Old Testament Hebrews, that's absolutely not true. It's absolutely not true. As a matter of fact, Gnostics believed in that. Now, Gnostics, where they get their philosophy from? From the very Greeks that Bob is praising. So I'm doubly confused here. Actually, it's a Greek idea. I mean, Greeks use that idea. They use that idea against Christians. They say, how can, how can matter be good? Gnostics, how can matter be good? Matters, and he acknowledges these two groups. But Gnosticism, again, it comes from Roman paganism of its time. It's not something that just happened magically. Okay. So how can... How can matter being evil is how can it be a jewish idea when we see in genesis that all that god created is good it's again i'm i'm incredibly confused here and if you look at the church fathers they take the side of jerusalem not athens right athens is the side that bob takes jerusalem is the side that the church fathers take does that mean that we're like we're like jews now like oh yeah we're like we're like we're like jews baby uh we're basically like Jews, we just believe in Christ. No, uh, <laughs> that doesn't mean that either way. I'm just saying that matter being created, uh, creation being good is a Hebrew idea. It's a revelation to Israel. And later on, it's a revelation they, they, they themselves rejected. So let's move on. Uh, Bob rightly points out that the homosexual tyranny that will eventually come is much worse than any tyranny that we'll be, we will be seeing. He says, Should the tyranny that has descended on our age ever gain the power it seeks and then be challenged enough to feel itself in danger, the mass annihilations that will be carried out by the homosexual, transsexual, and especially lesbian commissars will exceed in scale and cruelty anything that has yet happened in known history. Imagine lesbian mulatta commissars with young Martin Sheen face and haircut manning the future Bergen Belsons Installations that will span tens of miles. Uh, I agree. Uh, I think I think homosexuals are a lot more ruthless than any other people group. Uh, some people are asking for me. Uh, All right. So I think yeah, we're done with the with the religion stuff. Finally. Uh, that's the that's the part that I didn't like. Honestly. The most interesting part is about civilization and politics and whatnot. Now we're getting to the interesting part. Now let me see. Yeah. So Bob, in his view of civilization, is very interesting. He says civilization is... The idea of civilization hinders the freedom of man and emasculates him. Civilization hinders the freedom of man. We think about Western civilization. He has, he has things to say about and how why Western civilization is actually good. But for him, right, when we think of, he says, Westerners look at the East as the first examples of civilization in history. Aside from the problem of defining what a civilization is, the concept of cities and civilizations limits man. The big difference between East and West is the concept of citizen in the West. So for him, the West ha protects this nomadic spirit with the concept of citizenship. East doesn't do that. They don't have the idea of citizenship because they don't. And I will say, I will argue because they don't have an idea of personhood. The Greeks had somewhat of an idea, some of them. But especially in Christian societies, you have this idea of personhood. Now, Bob doesn't mention that it's a Christian, that Christians... Have this, but I think the Christian idea of citizenship is what exactly mitigates the problems of civilization. 
the the West attempts to mitigate the evils of civilization, for, but again, he thinks that it fails in doing so. Buddha did what he did, essentially because he attempted to escape the city and move into the steppes to become a sort of a spiritual nomad and flee in the wilderness. He, uh, so that's his theory on why Buddha did what he did. I don't believe that, but whatever. He says the Japanese man gets an allowance from his wife who often physically depletes him, takes his phone allowance, his lunch money. I can affirm what he says. <laughs> the woman rules Vietnam and the faceless clerk or mentioned who claws his path in the ant heap of the society is beholden to his hectoring wife like a slave. Matriarchy and anonymity are the principles of these piles of biomass. Never call them hives. The hive is noble. The hive can be a work of beauty and order. But the city, the city in its original form, is humanity reduced to a steaming rat pile. In the hive, the ant or the bee achieves the full development of its inborn nature as worker, or warrior, or queen. But who can say this of most cities in history? Uh, Constantinople. That's a... <laughs> Constantinople, uh, I guess. Uh, do you think man stamping papers, scheming to escape wrath of long-nailed office autocrat with spittoon who hawks smoked fish out of newspapers with fingerless gloves or sells birds with clipped wings to jeering human macacas? Do you think such creature is a specimen of well-turned life? I see the point that Bob is making, but... And I'm gonna... And this is like kind of like a pre-critique because we're gonna get to his kind of view, his alternative, but... I think the same thing, this, the things he says, I think the same thing can apply to his view. So actually, give me a second. Uh, I'll be right back. I need to, I need to handle some things. I'll be right back in 30 seconds. Give me a second. Dang, it's so hot in here. Had to open the air conditioner. So freaking hot in here. It's like it's a hot it's as hot as I am. Um That reminded me by the way while I was out and I missed on one of the other critiques that I was gonna make about Bob's uh polytheism paganism i guess and he he himself says like he when he speaks of multiple gods says gods if they exist so i think he himself is not certain um uh, that's kind of the understanding that i get he speaks of gods sometimes but he's like gods if they exist or whatnot but the problem of polytheism was explained by Ate uh, saint athenagoras of athens and his argument was based on analogia entis uh, in in some form of analogy entis, and that's that. If well, in cre in creation we see a single rational principle, right? So two plus two equals four, everywhere. There is no contradicting rational principles or different rational principles operating different parts of the world or even the universe, right? Again, two plus two equals four in America, but maybe there's a different ra uh, rational principle in Japan where it's six, right? That doesn't that that's not the case here. So. Uh, there's an analogia, there's a one single rational principle. If there's one rational principle, then that means there's one God. And St. Athenagoras then points out, if there's one God that can do these things, then what's the point of a second or third or other gods? Now you might say, well, we need them. Uh, and, and Bob will say, for example, the only way out, I guess you will say, but the, but the gods, they all have a unified will. Now, wait a minute. If they all had the same will, then they must have the same substance. And if you take that route, then you're literally admitting the Christian position. Because now there are three, the three divine persons of the same substance, single source of their divinity, the Father. Uh, I don't see how that's... Uh, <laughs> That's where you come to, right? If And if you're going to talk about a subordination system, I think that's just moving the problem to a different step. So I want to note that. Uh, <clears throat> Bob says that Aristotle compares two civilizations. So there's a Northern European civilization that's nomadic, it's barbarian, and there's a submissive Oriental civilization. 
Aristotle says both are bad extremes, but Bob then moves on to say the Greeks respected the, the Northern Europeans a lot more than the civilized Orientals, even though both Greeks and Orientals are civilized. He even says that the Orient is the enemy of the West. Now, this is a... a Bob hates uh, Far Eastern Asians. <laughs> um... I guess it's because, you know, his whole thing is about being nomadic, being a free spirit, right? Not a free spirit, that sounds a bit gay, but being nomadic. It's kind of his idea. Uh, and the Orient is against that, They're against the idea of personhood, individuality, freedom. They're bug men. They're all bug men for him. So they're the enemy of the West. And here's an interesting quote for him. Nevertheless, in spirit, I will say, even now the European has much more in common with the African than with the Asian. I know many dorks who fetishize IQ above all else will disagree with this. The Orient and Asia has always been the enemy. Does that include the... the does, it, does that include Anatolia? <laughs> I would like to ask that. Uh, Africa is mostly irrelevant. The African may even be an ally and only became a problem under conditions of modern mass democracy. When he has been manipulated and stirred up by others. Interesting. Uh, how he says Europeans... I think he's making a connection that both Europeans and Africans have the nomadic mindset. So, have the Bronze Age mindset more accurately. Whereas Asians don't have that. And so the Europeans are closer than, to Africans. Uh, what's my take on it? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I need to think about it. <clears throat> Another very interesting point that is incredibly insightful. He says that racism and true environmentalism are the exact same thing. Bob says, and I quote, The modern left cannot ever be environmentalists because their priority is not the environment. It is only the Western civilization, right? Only Western civilization and India that cares about animals and nature. Uh, actually, that's my note. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's my note. I'm, I should have made it much. I hope I didn't read my note and said it was from Bob. Uh, but that's my note. Yeah, so the modern left is not environmentalist. They cannot be environmentalist because their priority is never the environment. It's the Western civilization, India, that cares about animals, that cares about nature. Uh, rest of the world civilization treat animals with contempt. Oh, I'm so dumb. That's not, that. I, that is actually bad. That's just so strange. Anyways, that is him. He says that industrial agriculture is an evil needed to be stopped. But the only people that care is the European man. No one else. Environmentalist groups like Sierra used to oppose immigration because third world immigration contribution contributed to worse living standards. Very good point. Since only the Western man cares about the environment. Non-Western people live more naturally, he says, right? So one of the critiques that will be against his position is that look at the Africans, they live so natural. But he will say that does not mean they actually care or help the environment. So for example, foreign aid to Africa does not lead to healthier living conditions. But instead, it results in more people, which results in more people using resources which ultimately means more damage to the environment. So, no, that's, that's not true, he says. I, uh, he says that, yeah, caring for the environment is a Western idea. Thus, environmentalism and racism are deeply rooted and in inseparable. This is what his argument is. It will very, this will very much explain the sudden rise of Pine Tree Gang you see on Twitter, right? The kind of like right-wing environmentalist gang that we see. And this will very much explain that. Um, I don't know. What, what do you think about it? Uh, I think that there's some, there's some logic behind it. This is another fact that I really agree with, Bob. He says that the problem is in technology. And he's not speaking against trans... Not... He's not talking about transhumanism, but the idea that we should downscale technology, right? He says we shouldn't downscale technology, and I do agree with him, and this is something a lot of people will disagree with me, but downscaling on technology will make things even worse. Because we already live in the if we if we try to live under 
15th century conditions is a extreme but if you try to live under 15th century conditions if you try to live no sorry if you try to live the 15th century lifestyle and i'm talking about farming and all that stuff if you try to live that lifestyle with the 21st century conditions what do you think is going to happen everything's going to get screwed up <laughs> so if you if you downscale on technology you it's going to get much worse you're going to cause massive death you're going to cause massive problems so the pro environment left the anti technology people uh, are short sighted i think and I, I agree with bob uh for bob the problem is democracy i definitely agree because with democracy you it enables the mindset of certain groups that impose their beliefs on the populace and the pro environment left is our is against environmentalism because it advocates more power more democracy for people who are against the environment he says there is no inner work of technology that inevitably leads to human subjection the tendency exists merely because by allowing an overwhelming increase in the numbers of the superfluous superfluous it gives them and those who cater to them power when it is mixed with democracy the left environmentalist among many others is misguided because he wants more power given to such people he attacks precisely those elements of the modern vest of modern technology even of modern culture that can mitigate the rule of the superfluous and the destruction of nature including human nature here's a quote that he says great lie for age is that it is about the freedom of the senses liberation of the desires from stodgy social and moral control so is it speaking against moral facts in fact even middle ages man lived with more lust for life even more sexualist. So he's talking about this idea of vitality, this inner vitality of man, love for life, energy for life. But the key thing that I want to mention is that he points out how they worked less because of the feast days. Great point, Bob. Why did we have feast days? Well, because of the church. Because of the church, we had feast days. We had feast days of the saints. We had feast. We had religious feast days. Holy days, that's where the word holiday comes from. It comes from holy day. That's why supposed holidays like Martin Luther King Day is not a holiday because it's not a holy day. Because Martin Luther King is not a holy man. Um, a lot of people need to hear this. And vice versa. <clears throat> not vice versa, but more so on, etc. There is minimum amount of work done possible to have enough crops and to pay the taxes that were relatively small. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we need more people making this point. Most modern men hardly had the property of the medieval freeholder. Exactly. People talk about serfs. You retard. You're not even a serf. You're a literal slave. You are worse than a serf. You don't even own anything. You t you you they they criticize slavery. But what is slavery? Well, you are you're under a person, and that person provides you living conditions so you can work, so they can work for him. How is that any different from modern slavery? There's only a middleman now, and that's money. <laughs> the middleman is not money. But now you have to buy your own house. Okay, but your own house is a small gay retard house. It's not. It's not a. It's not a big house that you can live in. You don't have space where you can go outside and enjoy life. You don't have any of that. And he says, he criticizes, he's, he's, he talks about uh, the hygiene being bad, disease being rampant, infant mortality was high. And he's like, this is not my favorite time. Like, that's not good. But once you survive childhood, work is the great greatest difficulty in life. But once you survive childhood, it's all good. Uh, I will add that like, yeah, it is like infant mortality is high, but infant mortality today is also just as high because of abortion. So, uh, which one would you prefer? I would prefer then, then now. <laughs> uh, so if you add an abortion, then it's actually just as bad, if not worse. Uh... Bob talks about creation myths and how they differ. He talks about Karpokratian Gnostics 
who commit the most absolutely evil and most degenerate acts to re revolt against the evil Demiurge. Right? So, so in this section, he talks about the Gnostics. Uh, and then Bob says he doesn't, he's, he's saying, I'm not agreeing with the Gnostics, but they're a lot more realistic than the Christian alternative in that sense. Because Christians believe creation is good, right? Whereas, how can creation be good? There's death in the world. There's much more evil in the world than there's good. There's a huge problem with that logic. And that is that he's, again, approaching from a natural theological standpoint. And that refutes Roman Catholics and Protestants. I don't think Protestants can answer his arguments because they... They approach from the same exact perspective. But this is like, think of it this way. Let's say that you live in a room and you know you know you don't know many things about the real world, but one of the things you don't know about the real world is flowers. Are you going to be able to find flowers in observing with sense perception? No. You're not gonna be able to find uh flowers in your limited living space because there isn't any there. But there are flowers outside of your living space this is an analogy this is not a like a but let's say that there's a book it comes to you it explains human history and you read oh there is this thing called flowers it doesn't exist here i can't find it here but apparently there is this thing called flowers so what is the point that i'm making here well the point i'm making here is that if the world is fundamentally different originally from what it is now then you can't find that world by looking at nature you need you require revelation and that's why you have the the fall of adam the original state of the world is garden of eden okay the fall of adam is unnatural it introduced sin and death into the world that's why you have evil in the world but also at the same time you talk about evil but how do you explain evil in your worldview i mean um, I haven't seen it in his book, how he can explain what is evil, what is not. And again, it's not an academic book, so I'm not going to hold him to that standard. But because he doesn't do that, uh, I have to kind of ask the question, you know, how does he believe that there is such a thing as evil in the first place? Or why should we escape the world? Or why is it more convincing, right? If there is no evil, then how is that more convincing than the other? It's not, right? So... Again, this is the problem of having this this natural theological uh, lens of looking at the world, looking at creation, looking at the universe. And it this doesn't necessarily match up to reality. If if the idea of garden of even a uh, garden of Eden is possible, then that possibility alone here's a, here's the other problem. If you think that the world you're living in is the only way, way it is, as in, oh, you know, there was no Garden of Eden, there was no other condition that the world was in, but changed into being something else. Uh, is that not based on fate? So ironically, uh, his critique will go back to him. Is that not based on fate? He talks about problem of induction as well. Like he mentions, oh, you know, I think history is falsified. He, he, he says, for example, St. Augustine. I don't believe that St. Augustine existed uh, because he had bad Greek, which is, I mean, St. Augustine himself says he couldn't speak Greek. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, he talks about history may be falsified and yeah, that's, that is a point of that. But uh, the same problem can be applied to his worldview. So... Ultimately, his position reduced itself to skepticism. Whereas we will say at least, yes, there is a point, there's a possibility. That's why in our worldview, we can address that by saying that God can preserve historicity of the church, of reality, of history. That doesn't mean that it has to be pristine, absolute perfect. But it also means that we don't mistake like... We don't actually treat someone that didn't exist as if they existed, right? We don't say that, right? So we don't even come to that, those stupid conclusions, right? So there's a providence, there's a personal providence in creation. We can explain that. Bob cannot. Bronze Age pervert, I'm sorry, but you cannot. And that's, I think that's a weakness that he has in his system is that I think a lot of the stuff he says is good. I think what he's promoting is good. But if, but 
his religious system cannot justify that and that's genuinely worrying and that's probably why you see like these different mini bobs around <laughs> like the ortho bob catholic bob uh, atheist bob right you, the, yeah like the, these different groups because i think they realize that hey you know it is about religion like this system is good but we kind of need a religious justification so we need that and I think it only with Christianity can you get this. Only with Christianity can you get this per idea of personhood that the Far East does not have and he, that he hates them for it. So is there anything else I want to add? Uh, I think... I feel like I forgot something. That I forgot a point that I was going to make. But I, I don't have vital life energy in May. So... Uh, But again, uh, my point is that if you're going to appeal to skepticism in history, that point can be made against you. And he like cites many historical figures to make his arguments. Uh, bro, how do you know they exist? How do you know it's not from a Christian? <laughs> how do you know it's not like he says, like, uh, how do we know like the Bible is even uh, like, how do you know the Bible is from the true Christians? Right. It's kind of like silly, like, oh. How do you know which Christianity is the true Christianity? How do you know your world is the true world? How do you know how do you know the Greek philosophy you have are actually Greek philosophers? How do you know they are not from the Christian era? You don't. You don't. <clears throat> Ultimately. Now you might say, well actually we do because we can do scientific observation. Wait, 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 wait a second. How do we know scientific observations are true? You can't say they're true because they're true. <laughs> you can't use science to prove science. So how do we know that scientific increase can lead us to perceptible truths? <clears throat> Again, you can't know that. But if you go down the skeptic route, that's also self-defeating. So what's the alternative? I think the alternative is Christianity. Uh... So he has this classical foundationalistic kind of viewpoint that causes a lot of problems. I think I think Bob considers a lot of like uh, a lot of things that we know like personhood, masculinity as like brute facts instead of theory laden things. Um, Bob says that the greatest government is a military government. Uh, I'm not a pro military guy, but I do see the logic in that. I don't think it's it will be good in today's world, but in the past world, I think there is, yeah, I think there's a lot of advantages with the military government, especially look at Sparta, which he used the example of. Doesn't mean the Spartan education system is absolutely 100% perfect, but I think there's a lot of things that we can learn from it. Uh, Bob speaks about Alcibiades. Uh, let me actually get to that book. I get to that section because I don't have it in my notes. It is a section 50. Take some time to. So he starts. So the kind of the point is that like how Athenians, ancients were a lot more superior than to the modern man. So he says he starts with saying, imagine a Mitt Romney, but he's a different Romney. He's a he's a he's a Romney who actually was capable of acting like he looks and was worthy of his looks, right? Imagine a younger Mitt Romney who rouses the nation to a new war against India through power of charisma and speech alone. Then he leaves on a ship to head to the armies conquering India, but then come rumors that Mitt ran a black mass Satanist dinner in New York. Also, people awaken one day and find that someone defaced the Holocaust Museum and the Lincoln, Lincoln Memorial. Rumors spread that it is Mitt and his friends in preparation to overthrow the government. So he is recalled from his command to stand trial instead of returning. Mitt re runs to Russia where he becomes a major advisor to Putin. Soon though, he finally has to leave in a great hurry when it is discovered he has been banging Putin's wife in secret. He runs to China, where again he miraculously becomes a major political force and advisor, adopting Chinese customs and language with ease. After some time, he leaves China and ends up living in Afghanistan, with the tribesmen as one of them, in one of their much fortresses, where he, where he is finally found by American special forces and he goes out fighting, charging them repeatedly with machine gun in his glorious black and gold armor and dune-like headset. 
And then you now you might say, this is fucking wild. This is insanely crazy. But what's the point of this? His point is, this is what Alcibiades is from Athens is. <laughs> and and this is very inconceivable today, but this is what Alcibiades is. Alcibiades, Alcibiades, whatever you want to say. <clears throat> that was very interesting. <laughs> <clears throat> He said, Bob says that dead bodies are rigid, whereas lightly bodies have energy and they move or they're fluid. And this analogy applies to life. If you have a rigid, boring world, boring life, <clears throat> like, like in the modern world, and you see this in politics, like it's rigid, it's, it's, it's lifeless. You have a dead political life. You have a dead life, if that is the case with modern life. And that's what modern world is. And he points out, this is why Trump is like, because he's fluid, he's energetic, he's lively, he's lively. And he destroys political rigidity. Uh, Bob then moves on to the analogy with the story of Hippocleides, who convinced the father to marry his daughter, right? And then he, in the wedding, uh, he gets drunk, he starts to acting crazy, he goes to kaka, cuckoo, he starts to dance, he does, he does some crazy breakdance moves. But remember, Greeks don't have pants. And if you read Paul Scullis, pants are for, actually, if you read Greeks, pants are for homos because Persians had pants and in Persians were homosexuals. Greeks are cool and masculine. They show their legs. They had skirts, not exactly skirts, but they had skirts. Okay. So when you're doing break dance, yeah, your underside is going to be shown to everyone when you're break dancing like a madman. And this is what Hippocleides did. And his father, seeing the way he acted, said, you dance yourself out of marriage, Hippocleides. And Hippocleides says, Hippocleides does not give a shit. He says, Hippocleides doesn't care, but might as well say Hippocleides doesn't give a fuck. And he mentions Diogenes the Cynic, who tells Alexander Great to proverbially to fuck off from his shade after Alexander Great asks him what his wish was. And Bob gives this example, and his point is, and I'm very sorry for cussing as I'm becoming, but... Still, kind of to illustrate the point. Um, but what is the point here? What is the po point in these stories? It is about living life with energy. It is about ceasing to be, be this rigid, dead, lifeless, stupid, little, oh, too nice guy kind of deal. This is why I will add that nice guys finish last because they're rigid. They don't have life in them. They're betas. They don't have life. They don't have activity. They're slaves. They're mental slaves. They're mental slaves to women. They listen to what their women say. Blah, 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 blah. But the woman doesn't want that. They want the other, way, the other thing. The woman wants the man to be lively. But the beta, the, the rage cuck beta bucks cannot do that. Or rather, he does not do that. And so... The purpose of the beta buck is to be a, an ATM machine, as Dick Masterson says. Anyways, he then points out, didn't the Christians also believe in give us our daily bread, implying that this is enough and you shouldn't worry about anything else, even for the weak? Uh, that's, is he, if he's saying that's the only pur that's the main purpose, and that's wrong. There's many reasons why that give us our daily bread. But... Uh, I see his point. I mean, the, the importance about like loving what you have is, uh, he says, Nietzsche says good things about poverty, independence, and being of good cheer. And these were very poor men, but the sons of God need nothing more. And I don't, I don't know if he says sons of God in like talking about Christians or is he talking about something else? I don't know. But let me get a drink. Actually, let me, let me take a break here. Um, before I take a break, I think I remember... Ah, I'll remember after the break. I'll take a, I'll take another minute break. Uh, I'll close the air conditioner. Hopefully, it's not producing that much noise. I'll be back in a minute. <clears throat>
Okay, I'm black and let's let us continue with our journey to the Bronze Age mindset. Uh it's not going as good as I thought it would, but I'm having I'm having a good time. Uh I'd I'd rather play Katana Zero though. <laughs> oh. uh. I just thought is what I'm doing what Alcibiades is doing? Like, <coughs> like doing what I want, like being like, oh yeah, I I'm gonna take a pause by the way, you guys, and I'm gonna like, like mating people, <laughs> making people wait. Is that what, is that what like I'm doing right now? <laughs> kind of made me start thinking. Maybe I do have the Bronze Age mindset in some sense, but I don't have physical beauty, so I don't think I have. According to Bob, that is. Maybe I do. Uh, <clears throat> Bob points out. I should have said Bob means Bronze Age pervert. I should call him Mr. Pervert. Or like Mr. Pavar, Mr. Pervert. Mr. Pervert. What do you think about uh, friendship? Mr. Pervert says modern friendship does not exist. It's dead. Because. In the modern age, friendship has become and means to an end rather than becoming a genuine love for another human being. This is, I will add, that this is fundamentally why the modern West misunderstands ancient love and thinks, it, thinks it's sexual. He himself says this as well. So, for example, we see a lot of like these like fake retard historians who takes Adelphophoesis in ancient Christian context where you have like spiritual brotherhood. Uh, in the church, they think this is like like gay marriage in the church. If you actually believe that, here's what I think of you. I think you're a stupid faggot and you should probably shut the fuck up. I'm sorry for using cuss words. It's an unbecoming of a Christian. I will confess this to my priest, but you should really shut the fuck up if that's actually what you believe because you have no idea what friendship is. I 100% agree with Bronze Age pervert that... The modern understanding of friendship is absolutely retarded. He says that friendship... Uh, let me see. Let me, maybe I wrote that. Uh, yeah, I wrote this. So friendship is a camaraderie between brothers. In some... Not real brothers, but spiritual brothers. So in some sense, there it can be a means to an end. But it's not also the means to an end. It's more so... You develop your friendship in a journey with a group of people that you're in a journey with. And that is why when you see, and, and some people might laugh at these like examples, but like you see like animes like Jojo, why do people like them? The whole concept is you have a group of male friends who go on a journey together and they have a real bond of friendship with each other, right? This is, this is not only Jojo, this is in many different... Uh, Japanese media where you have like friends doing friendship stuff being on a journey together Persona is another example of this I haven't played Persona but um, I heard Persona is a lot like that so this concept still exists I, I could give the example from Japanese media does it exist in the West? I haven't seen those examples really well in Western media uh, <clears throat> most of the time the closest examples end up being gay porn uh, <laughs> in the West Gay softcore pornography, like, I don't know, Brokeback Mountain or something like that. Uh, so, I, I don't know, but, you know, why do people watch Georgia? Why do people love that? You have a group of men going on a journey together, and even at the beginning, they don't even like each other, but they go through hardships with each other. They share the same exact experiences. They share the same goal, and it starts pragmatically, but it becomes a real spiritual friendship that they have with each other where all of these characters genuinely love each other and i'm not saying love in this pederastic idea of sexual love that's not what love is but genuine care for one another wanting the best for other people that's what love is okay not not wanting to bang the people banging other people is not what love is if you think that's what love is then you're a homosexual and you're a faggot okay 100% if that's what love is for you you're a pederast, you're a pedophile. You're a pedophile because you claim to love children and then you say that love is all about sex. However, you're not a pederast, you pedophile. 
Anyways, gotta get that strong masculine energy to kind of reflect that. But I don't know, I enjoy I enjoy like videos once in a while like this where I can get like raw emotional. It's really fun. I enjoy it. And I can take as much as time as I want. And maybe people will not watch this till the end. I don't care. There'll be 10% of people who watch the video that will watch it till the end and they will feel raw, powerful emotion. That's what we need now. That's exactly what we need. And that's what I shared with Bronze Age Pervert is that that is precisely what we need. Yes, we need to control our passions. And when I say passions, I'm not speaking about passions in the Christian sense, right? But I'm speaking about passions in the sense of what we love. What makes us human, right? And we need to unleash them in a controlled way, un controlled chaos in some form, not in, in an ultimate sense, but rather controlled chaos for a personality where when we unleash us, it exposes who we truly are. So exact, there's examples that Bob gives. Many military bands were strong because of friendships. There's a Spartan knight squire dynamic in education, Epaminondas and Pelopidas, who reformed Tebes into a new government form. Uh, there are Jewish youth guards, in modern example, legionnaires, right? The Romanian legionnaires, Boy Scouts. They are strong because of friendships. If they didn't have friendships, if they didn't have mutual love for each other, do you think that many of these military bands, mercenary bands, or of, of the past, of the ancient days, no one will have even cared about them. But the strength of those mercenary bands is because of love. Exactly. And that is precisely why, and this is for the Orthodox Christians here, why is the church not doing this? We need male-based fraternities. And I'm not speaking about like groups where we have like women and men. Fuck that. I don't want women in my fraternity. We need men in fraternity and we need to engage in warfare, spiritual warfare, with other men and develop real friendship this way. This is how you develop friendships, right? The apostles, again, the apostles with Jesus Christ, the apostles with each other. Do you think the apostles will be friends and love each other if they, if they didn't go on a journey with each other? So strife, journey, challenges, it's what provides friendships. And I want to emphasize this on so many times. How else do you think? It's just going to be, oh, I like visual novels. Oh, I like reading books. I read Dostoevsky. Oh, do you read Dostoevsky? Let's talk about reading. The this is not friend. This is homos. This is faggotry. Okay, that's not what friendship is. You're just two people that like the same thing. You're not friends. You're acquaintances. Unless you're going through a real struggle with one another to improve, you're not friends, you're, 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 you're boy lovers. I don't know. <laughs> Let's move on. Uh, I, stuck out, I got stuck up on this point a bit too much. So, Bob claims that, Bronze Age Pervert claims that the idea of Superman does not start with Nietzsche, uh, but it starts with the Greeks, and he cites Plato and Plato says that the secret desire of all Greeks was to be a tyrant. And Bob takes that in another direction. And he says, they want to be kings, but what does being a king mean? Does it mean having a political position? Well, no, that's not what a real nomad thinks, right? He has, again, nomadic mindset, doing what you want, being a real man. That's his mindset. Do I agree with it again? Not fully. I don't believe it. We should not be nomadic in the face of God, for example, definitely. But there, there is some sense where there is some truth, not fully, but I think there is some sense, there is some logic behind it. So for example, being a king, look at Periander of Corinth. Periander did whatever the hell he wanted to do, okay? If he wanted to experiment on people, he did that with people of Corcyra. He castrated them, he cut off their balls, okay? Why? Because he just wanted to do it, because he just felt like it, right? And... The point here is that, and Bob himself said, he's not saying this is a good thing. He's not saying we should be like this guy. He's, he's pointing out that this guy didn't care about the crown, you see. But he's a king. He's a king in the true sense of the word. He's a king because he's using his power to unleash. So again, is that a, whatever, whatever he unleashed, that's not a, obviously a good thing. 
Now, what, a good example will be St. Justinian. St. Justinian will be the perfect example, the Christian example of what Bronze Age Pervert is talking about. Because he was, he was in some sense, he was obedient to God. He was obedient to his ordinances and whatnot, 100%. But St. Justinian basically unleashed Christian passion. Again, we're not talking about passions in the Christian, like sinful sense. <clears throat> but rather something else, something more relevant to love for life or something like that. Someone is, someone is making noise outside. I was I got shook for a little bit. But so he points out that being kings, they like Plato was not talking about Greeks wanting to be kings in the political sense. They want to be kings in the sense of supermen, in the sense of what Nietzsche was talking about. Uh so with this example, the ancient the 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 decadence of the modern elite is incomparable to the decadence of the ancient elite because the ancient elite was a lot more in your face or a lot more energetic whereas the modern elite is a lot more uh how should we say this the modern elite is the boring that kind of decadent he says uh i don't agree with that we have we have like really crazy satanic stuff with the, with the elites but he's basically saying they're not they're not bronze they're not they don't have the bronze age mindset this <laughs> is basically what he's saying. Um, Bob has an extremely good point about second wave, third wave feminism. He says, liberation of women is prostituting the woman to financiers, lawyers, and other employers. You are prostituting your wife to the employers, to the people that employ your wife. So you're actually just a pimp. If you're married to a woman and you send her off to work at some lawyer or some schmuck, you're just a pimp and you're prostituting your wife. And this prostitution is not always sexual, although sometimes it actually is. It's not always sexual. But you're giving her away to other men so she can spend time with other men and other institutions so they can use her. That is prostitution. I, I definitely agree with Bob. So moving on, Bronze Age Perth says that feminism is a revolt of women against the new democracy and institutions and the betification of men, starting from the 19th century. He says they have been in a revolt against the inability of the bug man to command authority or respect. I agree, yeah. And you must understand that there is no bottom to this freedom or revolution. There won't be any opportunity to say, I told you so. They will never learn a lesson from their foolishness. And they resent the insecurity you have them you have put them in the calamity that will surely follow from the going down this path will not be a teachable moment to anyone it will destroy the civilization no great civilizations no great nomadic mindsets no great civilization and cultures were never founded nor kept alive by the betas the nerdoids who have taken over much of the right have be have brainwashed you to this view but it's wrong women never loved the shopkeeper they never loved the timid merchant with the nasal voice they never loved the clockmaker or the craftsman. They have always loved the knight, the sailor in love with the wild ideas of the sea, the adventure and the pirate. And I will add, they always loved the Andrew Tate. Do you know Andrew Tate? Cobra Tate? My man, Cobra Tate. He has 17 girlfriends or something. And all the girls know and they don't care. They don't care because they, they got a shot at dating the Cobra Tate. That's the guy. By the way, that's the guy. You know, you know Michaela Peterson, right? Jordan Peterson's daughter. That, that girl, that girl who posts pictures of her in bikini and Instagram, her underwear on Instagram, people are like, oh, she's, no, she's a good, because I love Jordan Peterson, he will never be a cuckold. Wrong. Michaela Peterson dated Tate, knowing that Tate was fucking a bunch of different women. <laughs> and do you know what she did to date Tate? He left his husband. She left his husband. And his husband accepted her back because she rode the cock carousel enough and now she's back to her, to her husband. What a whore. And that man, what a better. What an absolute better. And if they even somehow see this, I don't care. She's a whore and that guy's a better. Pure and simple. Pure and simple. And you look at the guy, and he, he does look good. I mean, he looks like an 8. I will say he looks like an 8. But 
come on. <laughs> and it also highlights another thing about modern women, and that is that no, you can be an eight, you can have, you can be rich, you can have a good life, you can be a great guy. But if there's Andrew Tate's around looking at her, you know what she's gonna do? She's gonna say, "I'm leaving you. I'm leaving you. I gotta, I gotta spend ten minutes with Andrew Tate." Gotta, gotta spend 10 minutes with Andrew Tate. And then, if those women are really stupid, uh, then they get tricked by Andrew Tate. And Tate just puts them in a prostitution ring and they become cam girls. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. This is what actually happens right now. So, moving on. Bob says that this resentment is manipulated by the satanic power that rules our time. And that through this very drive from free, for freedom, women become more enslaved than she has ever been before. You won't be able to make women see reason and love a beta civilization. A fabrication of the HBD cuckold crowd of our time. Women will love you if you're a warrior. And they will help through the entirely retarded mechanism of democracy to elect men of glamour and charisma who are only immediate hope against the machine that runs our garbage world. I disagree with that. I don't believe there's a political democratic solution. Um, I think he's very misguided in saying that. And I don't think women... Like... Anyone that woman votes doesn't necessarily mean he's an alpha male. I mean, look at Justin Trudeau. He's a beta cuck lord. But women vote for him because he's a hunk. Because he looks cool. And look at the other ones. They're beta. And I, okay, that's a good point. But Trudeau is not a chad. Trudeau is a bitch. He's a little bitch. Okay. And he also points out that women elected Hitler and Mussolini. Yes, actually, no, people don't know this. Women elected Hitler. Exactly. Um, tough, tough luck for feminist women. Uh, should we give women right to vote? Well, they elected Hitler. I mean, I think Bob considered that as a bad thing, but maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I don't know. But, as I said... Um, he seems to think that through a democratic election, we might get, like, a base leader eventually, like, Trump, but better edition. But I don't believe, I don't think that's the case. I think the, I think democratic solutions don't exist. Um, I'm not advocating for accelerationism either. I'm just saying eventually democracy will collapse. And that's how we need to, I think ultimately, you know, ultimately what's important is converting a... Con Christianity, spreading Christianity, having a Christian worldview, spreading that worldview. Ultimately, that's what matters, and the political solution will come afterwards. That's that's how many Christians in the Roman Empire got a Christian Roman Empire. Uh, Bronze H. Bird points out that the samurai, for the samurai, it take, took them too long to realize that they had all the power during the Japanese feudal times. There was a weak bureaucratic, bureaucratic power in Japan, and it took the samurai... A bit too long for them to realize, hey, actually, we had the swords, we had the fighting skills, we can actually employ our the government unlike these weak bitches. Let's kill these people. And that's what they did. And eventually, maybe that might be that, that might happen. I think I think the people do have some sort of power and they don't really realize it. Maybe they do realize it, but they don't believe that they can coordinate it. That's also a huge problem, is that with the, with the mass populace, you can't coordinate. The only thing you can coordinate them is making them follow their passions. And I'm now here I'm speaking the, that in the Christian sense, their, their passions, their, their sinful uh, allegiances that they have. Uh, one of the critiques Bob makes against uh, ethnic nationalism is, is secessionism more so. So ethnic nationalism might be the future, but secessionism is not because no one wants to give away their land, to give away land that their ancestors died to keep. So seceding to your territory like Texas to Mexico is nonsensical because whites fought to conquer Me Te Texas, <laughs> right? So that's his point. And I think, yeah, I think that's a very basic instinct that a lot of people have. So I think that's a great point that he makes. And now this is the section where this is more about modern politics and what we should be doing in light of modern politics. And uh, and so we are approaching 
the N. We're approaching the end. I just told someone who's been waiting for me. They love me. David, David, I need you. David, you're my only love. I'm just kidding. I don't deal with women. Uh, I'm a nomad. <laughs> I'm just half joking. <coughs> Bronzish Perth says that online activism is very powerful. Things like white lives matter is very powerful because rejecting white lives matter is meaning that you say that white lives don't matter. And many things. And anonymity is huge. He says that it's a lot more effective than going outside and marching. Especially, and I will add that right wing is being persecuted today. I think this is very true. And that we should not listen to people that to tell that tell us to destroy anonymity. So this is something that happens in Orthodox circles. You get these like pre-list retard dads and like, I got my face in the dress on my Twitter. You don't, you're not a real man. Shut the fuck up, you retard. I'm not going to put my face in the dress. Well, I put my face, but I'm not going to put my address. Well, my case is a bit special because I live in a protected country. No one can touch me here. Um, but many people in America can be touched, right? So, shut, seriously, please shut up uh, <laughs> if you're going to tell people to stop being anonymous. Anonymity is very powerful. It's incredibly powerful. It's like... It's like in the Old Testament, I forgot who did this, but in the Old Testament, one of the prophets won one of the wars without killing anyone by like making a lot of noises and the enemy couldn't see them, but they thought, oh, they make a shit ton of noise. There has to be a ton of people in there. And they just ran away. Whereas it was just a couple people that did it and they just seemed make themselves seem powerful. So that's an example. So anonymity is powerful. And being active with your anonymity is very powerful. This is why Bronze Age Perth is anonymous. The an anonymous identity. There's, there's doxes going around about him. I don't know if that's true, but I, I won't talk about it. Um, if you're interested, you can look it up. But I, I don't know if that's him. Uh, Bob points out, how can we make a proper movement right now? I don't believe much in momentarianism, but his solution is, I think, incredibly perfect. He says that nationalists must present a healthy alternative to the eternal rule of ugliness in our time. Promote nature, beauty, physical bit fitness, preservation of high traditions, literature, art. 100% agree. We should definitely, this is why I'm doing this. This is why... If someone tells you, oh, you should not do theology because that's the, that's the thing, like, that's the thing that bishops do, tell them that they're a fucking retard that they should shut the fuck up. 100%. Because what they're doing is that they're, ag they're being against high traditions. We need more high traditions, not less. Okay? We need more high traditions today. This is precisely why I'm doing this. This is high tradition. <laughs> In some sense, it is. Yeah, this is promoting high tradition. In some sense, it is. In the modern sense. It's even a necessity. Because there is no school or university that will give you a worthwhile education. 100%. Don't go to university. And if you can, don't even go to high school. There are a variety of... Because they don't teach you about this. They teach you about stupid stuff. They teach you about... I don't know... Made up stuff. <laughs> And given the collapse of Boy Scouts, uh, na nature preservation movements will be one of the best. He points out, and another thing I definitely agree with him, women should not be part of political groups because they will always ruin it due to introducing sexual competition. 100% agree. Women should not be part of political groups. We should not make women part of political group groups at all. Uh, if they want to do things on the side, maybe, but they should not be... The full members, okay, hundred percent agree. That's why, like, I can't get behind women politicians, um, or like w women in political movements. The best thing modern right wing movements can do if they want to be real movements <clears throat> is to do charity and help their local communities. <clears throat> hundred percent agree. Another great point. So much wisdom. There's unironically so much wisdom. Um, exactly. This is what Christians need to do as well. 
we see a lot of people that like accelerationists or they, there's an alternative where they're like, oh, you know, let's just wait and like wait it out. Like this, this, this. No, 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 no. You have to be, you have to act on your beliefs. Okay. You have to actually act on your beliefs. You have to do charity. You have to be out there. You have to go out there. You have to remain as a firm social movement of promotion of a promotion of natural beauty, healthy living, healthy nationalism, healthy Christianity, I may, I may add. And any attacks on such groups. So he's talking about here. Like if you're promoting natural beauty, healthy living. And you're being attacked as Nazis and whatnot. No problem. Absolutely no problem. No problem because. People will see that. What matters is what people see. Okay. What matters is. What people see. If they're seeing the people attacking you for being Nazis. And all you're doing here is saying. We should have healthy bodies. We should be fit. We should love nature. We should preserve our nature. We should preserve our faith. We should love one another like God loves us. People will see that and they will say, these guys are retards. That's the point. That's why saints, that's why martyrs are so powerful. Because you look at the martyr and then you look at the people persecuting the martyr and the people looked at them and they said, this guy is the guy I want to follow. The other guys, they're, they're idiots. Exactly. And this is a strong mimetic technique is to force your opponent into accepting and defending the absolute worst people. Make them defend, Stalin. Make them defend the absolute worst gutter, gutter people. That's why All Lives Matter is a good example because if you're against All Lives Matter, then... Suddenly you're like, okay, wh whose lives don't matter? <laughs> That's why it's so powerful, right? All, it's okay to be white, right? That's also powerful. A good slogan of white lives matter. If you see someone rejecting white lives matter, wait, are you rejecting that white lives matter? And if they say, no, I don't, then okay, then white lives matter. That's, the, that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying anything else. <laughs> Bronze Age Pervert says, the friends you make are more important than the girlfriends or wives you'll have. I agree, definitely, 100%. And actually, your girl will admire you for this. That's also true. Not that you should do it for that reason. But it's an added benefit. Women admire men with great personal projects and who are not beholden to them. If she's your everything and your best friend and you should want to love with your life, blah, 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 she, she will lose the respect for all of you. And the greatest end that nationalists and allies have against the enemy is the fact that the enemy has sowed sexual chaos and has destroyed romance. Our parents' generations are responsible for this, but the lords of lies and ugliness, largely responsible for this, but the lords of lies and ugliness who rule our time continue it and use it as their greatest tool of control. So modern sexual dating and all that stuff, right? So this is the best way to awa awaken men to the evil subjection of our time and i will say also many women who are very unsatisfied on the other hand someone who is motivated simply by this problem is not reliable because there won't be any beta revolution and betas are unreliable because betas they're bitches they're bitches betas when they get a girlfriend they will drop all of their principles i have seen this so many times so many times you see the incels are full of these people and if you watch my video on whether incels are right, I speak of them positively, but this is one thing that they do, and they're bitches for it. They're absolute little bitches. They, everything they depend on is females accepting them. You are a bitch if you depend your life on women. You are a little bitch, and you're unreliable, and you're a beta, and that's not because of your looks, bro. That's because you're a stupid idiot. Okay? Because those people, those incels... They'll get a girlfriend. You know what they're going to do? Some of them. Some of them will never get a girlfriend. Some of them might get eventually a girlfriend. Do you know what they will do? They will hundred. They will flip 180 degrees. They will say insult them as evil. I had a girlfriend. I had such a good time. Fuck you. You never believed in anything you believe. You actually purposefully, supposedly believed in. This is why I'm 100%. I'm 100%. Test me on this. Quote me on this. If I... Get a girlfriend and drop my my beliefs on all of these things. Please unsubscribe from me. Please call. Please say all of the bad things about me. Please unsubscribe. Please whatever. 
okay? If I drop my principles because of some woman, please do that. Please do that for the good of me. Because I then, because I deserve it if that happens. But I've seen so many men, again, so many men dropping every principle they have for a woman. And that woman drops them in three months. And then they come back and they're like, oh, dude, like, actually, I was like, I was in the wrong. No, 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 no. It's not, it's not that easy. I believe in repentance. Maybe you did falter. Maybe you made a mistake. But it's not that easy, buddy. It's not that easy. You have to keep your beliefs. The moment you drop them. The moment you drop them, your woman is going to drop you. I've seen many men, he says, intelligent and well-educated, but weak in their core and too much concerned with women who gave up all higher aspirations once a half-decent girl came along. He later on says that women and men in the family should continue their mission, but I have, a, I have an issue and I'm ready to be critiqued on this, but I think... If once you have a family, I think that's the end. I think there's nothing more. There's no higher aspiration that you can do. You can do. And I'm not insanely defying the family. I'm rather saying that you don't have the time for have higher aspirations. You look at Hayao Miyazaki, for example. The guy's an absentee dad, right? He's a terrible parent. He's the worst kind of a father you will want, even by Japanese standards. And I'll, I'm telling you, Japanese fathers are really stupid. But he's like the worst parent you will want to have. And do you know why? Because he had higher aspirations during marriage. He is a terrible dad because he had higher aspirations. My point is that if you have high aspirations, I don't think you should marry. I think if your highest aspiration is to have a family, then pop more power to you. Great. Lovely. I just don't think you should marry. And yeah. And we're reaching the end of the yeah so that's my point the family becomes dysfunctional exactly if you have a higher aspiration than your family your family will inevitably become dysfunctional and you don't want a dysfunctional family because a dysfunctional family will produce dysfunctional children dysfunctional children will produce even more dysfunctional children this is exactly what's happening today we don't need more of this thank you and last note i have is that he thinks that science will Leave the constraints of comfort and entertainment. It's the, like the nitpicking I have. Um, actually, it already has left the constraints of comfort and entertainment. The difference is pop scientism left uh, has constraints of comfort and entertainment. But the weaponized science is without constraints. And I can tell you, it's terrible. And that doesn't mean that people think science unconstrained means that science at its fullest sense no that's not actually true it's like saying like if a man has full complete freedom does that mean that that man is a man in the true sense no he's not he's not a man in the complete sense but rather he's abusing his freedom against himself and i think this is the case uh so that's that's a that's i think this is already the case today uh what he's talking about so that's another critique i have and that is all of my notes and we're a little less than two hours. That 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 is all. Uh, I don't have anything more to add. Anything less to add. Yeah. Uh, this was a fun talk. I had a lot of fun doing this. I went full on. Full hyper energetic. Released some of my passions about my beliefs and whatnot. Because if I'm too robotic, then, you know, who am I, right? I, I loved making this talk. Uh, I hope you enjoyed listening to me. It was kind of bad at the beginning. It it went typical. Uh, it didn't it didn't go so good. I couldn't find my words. I had a hard time explaining myself. But then over on, when my when my anger hit maximum level, not my anger, but when I hit maximum level, I felt like I could actually explain myself properly. Anyways, thank you all for watching this so far, and. I, final final analysis of this book. It was fun. Good points and bad points alike. I really respect Bronze Age Pervert's understanding of uh, human vitality and its importance. I think that's definitely something. That, I think it's an, it, it can be it can be it it works in the Christian philosophy. I think definitely, um, but not in the sense that Bob thinks. So, for example, he talks about the importance of having uninhibited freedom 
at some parts of your life, right? And he said, if you're against this, you're basically bad. Uh, I don't believe in this. I don't, I don't agree. Uh, I don't think we should even have... I think it should be complete control and you should release it. But in what way, right? In what way? That's the question. So, but I definitely respect that the kind of n the new thing that he brings in in political masculinity i definitely respect that i agree uh i endorse that in fact i myself say a lot of things that he said in his book uh, i was interested in him explaining the connection between nietzsche and plato that was actually very inspiring <laughs> not inspiring but that was enlightening to say the least uh but as well, there's other important things, especially his religious views are not fit with his political views. It doesn't match up. And I don't say this as to own him. Like, oh, you're mega own, bro. You're that dumb. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm here to offer a very healthy and consistent and rational alternative. And I think only with Christianity, really, can he have the, the Bronze Age mindset worldview that he wants to promote. Because... What people are looking for with political worldviews is not what it is, but rather how you can justify it. And Christianity is the best way to justify worldviews. But Catholicism isn't because Catholicism runs into problems. Ironically, Bronze Age Pirate himself talks about. So my, the alternative is there, and that's called Orthodox Christianity. And I know that he is a very Orthodox Christian. He gave a really stupid... He said Orthodox Christianity is controlled by the state government. So like... That's dumb. That's that's not true. Uh, so yeah, that will be all. If you are if you're a BAP fan and you had you enjoyed listening to this, I would recommend you check out History of Christian Theology. If you liked watching this, I would recommend you to subscribe, like this video, share it to your friends, share it to your BAP bros. Maybe they will like it. Maybe they'll say this guy's a beta pedophile retard. He should post physique. Oh, he probably won't because his physique is so bad. Yes, my physique is bad. I do know that. And I don't know, either way, uh, thank you for watching this. I'll see you guys in the next video. God be with you all. Next video, I'll see you. Bye-bye.